Uh, hi, I'm Paul Bloomfield, uh, professor of philosophy here at UConn. Uh, I'm going to introduce everybody up front and do all my talking, then I'll just sit down, all right? So uh, first up, the first talk is Graham Smith, a professor of politics from University of Westminster, and Michael Morell, associate professor of political science here at UConn. And the title of their talk is uh, Designing Online News Comments to promote intellectual humility in public discourse. The second talk is going to be by Mark Alfano, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Delft University of Technology and Professor of Philosophy at the Australian Catholic University. The title of his talk is going to be Scaffolding the Media for Intellectually Humble Discourse. And the last talk is by David Dunning, Professor of Psychology at University of Michigan, and his talk is going to be called Epistemic Trespassing. So we'll start with Graham and Michael. Take it away. It doesn't work. <laughs> we tested it like four times. <laughs> start with the thanking Michael for Gemini. I was trying to find something against Michael, but thank you very much. <laughs> and thanks to Nathan in particular for organising the event. Um, I'm going to report on a project which um, has involved an awful lot of people. I, um, the three uh, co-PIs are, are up there, and Mark Klein, uh, who's a techn technology consultant, but also involved a bunch of students, a couple from UConn, um, from the University of Westminster, where I am, some online engagement specialists and some tech specialists. What we are interested in is how you could design the comments that are under on the, uh, online news to promote more intellectual humility. This is actually part of a broader interest that I've got, which is in relation to face-to-face -face and online, which is about how the institutional design affects deliberation and intellectual humility. I'm obsessed by this question of institutional design. I think one of the problems we've got in terms of online is we really haven't been able to take the learning that we've learned from face to face into that space. And I mean, there's all sorts of ways we have to think differently, but that's, that's another conversation for over dinner, perhaps. So the research question is, um, as we said, is can we design news comment platforms to promote dialogue that is more reasoned and intellectually humble? Uh, our very simple approach was to use um, a basic forum and two different arg test a basic forum against two um, different argument visualization platforms, and also because Michael's part of the team, treat team to test some em a small empathy treatment. So the three by two design, each of the treatments had uh, two groups. It was a field experiment. We were hoping to recruit um, 5,000 people, and our global re our recruiter thought we would be able to do that. We created the kind of video you've just been seeing, lots of Facebook ads, etc. But in between us putting the grant in and us starting to do the work, things like Cambridge Analytica happened. <laughs> and all of a sudden, people got very suspicious about being asked to be involved in this kind of project. We got loads of emails saying, this is a scam, this is a way of getting our data. We wrote back in, of course it's a scam, and we're trying to get your data. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, the, these were conversations apparently a year ago you didn't have. So this last year or so has really changed people's mind. And I think it's a really interesting problem for us to think about as, as people who don't necessarily want to use panels but actually want to go out um, and, and recruit participants. Out of those 1,500, over half of them logged on, which is pretty good actually for an experiment like this over the three-week period. And we had um, uh, 2,000, just over 2,700 comments across eight articles, so lots of lovely data. And we've done a pre- and post-surveys including intellectual humility measures. They were loaded in the front survey. Um, the second survey has a couple of them, but you know, we, we, we don't, we're not looking, we, the project isn't about whether we change intellectual humility, it's about the nature of the dialogue. But we've got a sense of who's on, we know who's on there, and they were randomized into these groups using, using those kinds of intellectual humility measures to ensure that the groups, were, the groups had, had good mix. 
everyone I guess knows most people have been on any well any forum, but we were interested in news forums about the various types of problems you have with new forum news forums. And our, our our question is, can you design news forums in different ways using these kind of different technologies, which I'll talk about. I won't go through these too much, but you know they are noisy places. It's really hard to find what people are saying because it's disappeared. They're asynchronous. The arguments about two days ago that you're interested in it, you're repeating it again. Tends towards group polar, you know, tends towards polarization. We don't see information cascades, the kind of things we're all familiar with. Argument visualization software offers a different approach to thinking about organizing um, uh, arguments online. Um, and the, the idea here is trying to focus ca on capturing different dimensions of an argument mm -hmm. and less on the sort of positionality and the identity of participants. In fact, for some of these bits of software, the identity disappears completely. Um, and so you're much more focused on the argument. We were testing two very different softwares. The Liberatorium, which comes out of informal logic, uh, I, uh, the discipline of informal logic, which uses this particular argumentation formalism, which you've got on the, on the other side. So it's an issue or question you've got, an idea of how you might address it. Then there'll be supporting arguments and rejecting arguments, and you build up a map. Other ideas, other ideas. And it's a very formal way of trying to represent the argument rather than representing it along the lines of the argument rather than what any particular individual um, thinks. And your, the collaborative exercise is to build that argument map. Polis, which was generated by a Taiwanese um, social, social movement, has a slightly different logic where you put up comments in response to the issue and then people can vote on them. Do they agree with them? Do they disagree with them? Or are they not sure, maybe, um, they're not sure about their, their view? And then the machine learning starts to show you, and we'll see, we'll see the platforms in a minute, how, um, how the different group see the diff um, are organized across those different arguments. Again, not individuals, but engaging with arguments. The experiment was supposed to run last year, um, <laughs> and it ran last month. So, uh, I can't show, um, so we're going to show you the platforms rather than the data, and we can talk about some of our analysis plans with you. Why is it delayed? Um, partly uh, because of a change in regulation in the UK, in, in the UK, because we're still in the European Union. I wish we'd left. In the UK. <laughs> <laughs> but the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, causes all sorts of issues. For example, you're not allowed to collect the IP addresses of people anymore, mm. which we are, we're going to use for geographical reasons. And suddenly, hang on a second, that was real important for us. And, and various other technical changes. We can't use American servers to collect data on European participants now, so we have to use, so, and all sorts of changes. And that related, and some of it was caused by the GDPR, but there were a series of unexpected technical challenges. Unfortunately, we were the first ethics approval that was needed under the GDPR regulations in my university. Mm. And they're kind of go, oh no, and it's not online, oh no, you're using Facebook, you know, every, I, everything. It took weeks and weeks, and then the same problem with IRB here as well. Excuses over. Um, <laughs> exit surveys are still happening at the moment, and follow here, follow the particular project website, and we'll put all of our stuff up there, and we'll share it as, as, as things emerge. This gives you a sense of our participants. We use the Leary scale that a lot of people have been using and a couple of additional test items. Uh, it's a skewed sample. Um, but we're not sure, and it's something which we could talk about, whether a right-hand skew is actually atypical or not. But that didn't matter too much to us because these were people who um, engage online anyway. I mean, no one would come to our project who didn't. Um, and we were able to distribute, to ensure a, different, a, a distribution across the groups. That's the only bit of data we've got at the moment, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'll talk a little bit about the background and then we'll go over to Michael. We worked with the New York Times, have kind enough to give us the right to use their op-eds and their articles. So we, these are the sorts of articles that people were talking about online. These were not, these were a lot of them quite uh, politically sensitive, you know, issues around um, immigration, the New Zealand massacre. We used whatever was going on in the news at the time. That was the point of the point of it, so we weren't hiding from anybody. Um, at this point, I'm just going to pass over to Michael, who's going to show you a little, show you around the platforms. And I think, as I said, we can't show you any data, but I think it's actually interesting to see the platforms and get some sort of sense of the way that people are starting to think about how you can organise arguments online. So as, as Graham perfect, as Graham indicated, um, we used the news articles uh, from the New York Times. We were able to use those, and so they looked uh, realistic. 
We used eight over three weeks. We had four during a phase that we consider a pre-moderation phase, so we were actually moderating the comments and everything before they went up, and we had to approve them, and we had monitors covering them 24 hours, well, mostly 24 hours a day. Um, and then we switched halfway through the experiment on all three platforms, so everything got the same. We switched to a post-moderation. Um, and we will be able to test whether there were any differences, but of course, since everyone did it, we have no kind of control group um, that we can compare that to, but we will be able to look at those two. So what the site, once they logged in, what the site looked like um, was they had this kind of uh, front page with all the articles. And of course, the first, we didn't actually use the Uber crash. That was one that we used for some testing, but the first article that we put up was on the uh, India-Pakistan conflict and uh, an article by Farhad Manju that said it was a parade of lies, which had a lot of things to do with fake news and those sorts of things. So it really uh, appealed to the people that we had in the experiment. And then every few days or so, we put up the articles, the, the separate articles, the new articles, if Stalin had a smartphone, ISIS returnees, New Zealand, hustle culture, uh, anti-vax, uh, Brexit, um, once the uh, report came out, uh, the Mueller report, we had the response. Again, Brooks had the best one we've just seen about that. Um, so we avoided really controversial <laughs> articles. <laughs> so they would go on and then they could click on the article. And then depending on the condition they went to, they were in, it took them to this. So then they had the article and they could read through the article all the way down. And then at the bottom, they had whichever particular platform they were working on. Now I'm showing you this one right here, so we did have a three by two. So the experimental, the empathy treatment, that was kind of my thing, it's very subtle. It comes out of social psychology where they just give them a little leak. We added a little bit of a, of a, of a visual to the normal imagine others uh, social psychology manipulation, but at whatever platform they were on, they had this if they were in the empathy treatment. If they weren't in the empathy treatment, it just said the conversation was moderated, please read the rules before joining the discussion. And then this is the forum. Now the forum looks like a regular threaded forum. The yellow, I'm not sure why, the yellow normally wasn't up there. I'm not I sure why. That, so I, I forgot to mention why we had to put so much money in. Why don't we found out that our developer was, um, was colorblind, so he was putting pink on yellow and things like that. It was, oh. Right, so we had to get a whole new developer to come in because the tech guy was colorblind. Um, <laughs> the only thing that's really different in terms of this kind of thread versus a normal news thread, and we did this so that it was consistent across designs, was we did provide what we call scenes. So at the top, we did a major question and then five sub-questions. We did that because the other platforms require that for those platforms to function. So that is an issue with the design. We didn't have enough people to like do another one where we didn't do that. But other than that, it looks like a normal forum, right? People can go through, they can like or agree, disagree, unsure, they can reply, et cetera, okay? So that's what the normal forum looks like. This, and I'm not going to show you anything, it's the same article, everything is the same down to this point. This is Polis. This is the argument uh, visualization platform that they would come in, and in this particular case what they would see is they would see statements, and this is why we needed seed. We start with five statements ourselves. They would write whether they agree, disagree, or pass unsure. They could also put their own statements up that then the rest of the group could respond to. Okay, so in some ways, this is a different kind of, uh, of way to looking at things. And then, after enough people have rated those things, it creates a visualization of the group. Now, you don't know who the other people are, you don't know where they're located, but it takes those, and through machine learning, develops different groups. So on this particular article, it ended up being that there were three different groupings of opinion on this particular issue. And then what you could do is you could go down to the bottom and figure out what the majority opinion was. So if you click on this, you could see the majority opinion, and that was on these different statements. You could figure out what separated each group. So like 80%, 7% of those in group, group A disagreed with statement number one, the mainstream politicians of media are responsible for the spread of extremist discourses and truths. So you can look at what statements and what things are separating the groups and get a sense of where you are in relation to everybody else in terms of these statements. 
Oh, I do have to do a shout out. So you said a Taiwanese group. They developed it for a Taiwanese situation, but it involved a Yukon alum. So I didn't know before this project started, but they, he was involved, and so there was a Yukon alum that was very important in developing the Polis platform. The deliberatorium platform looks like this, and this is the argument visualization map uh, platform. Uh, so the argument mapping occurs, we started with these seeds, they're hard to see separately now since they've been all worked on, and they're able to uh, add, in response to those seeds, either questions, that's what the pink question marks are, they can add ideas, which are these light bulbs, and then underneath the ideas they can add pluses and minuses, that is arguments in favor and arguments against. And you can see how it creates this map eventually. And some of them get rather deep. Now if you see a strike through, that means we moderated it and they never went back in and responded to our moderation. So, so we know that some people put stuff up that, and, and then never went back and, and changed it so that it fit within uh, the argument map itself. And some of the key ideas behind the argument map are there should be single ideas in each box. You should not bundle a bunch of ideas because then people can't respond to them. Um, you should have, uh, cons should be cons, pros should be pros. So sometimes we have to get them to change. You shouldn't repeat something that's already in the map. If you find something that you want to say, somebody's already put it up with there, you could agree or disagree with it. And if I click on one of these, we can see how you go to that, you have the opportunity therefore to agree, disagree, and be unsure. And then you can kind of look at the title of what people say. So the, here's the title of people motivated to some degree by the ideas of justice, fairness, and care. And then you explain what that means. And then people can either be discreet, say they're unsure. They can add a pro, add a con. Um, they can report it if it's, not, if it's nasty and that sort of thing. Um, some of this stuff they can't do because this is under my account. So it's actually a moderator. But we can see that. That's what the map actually looks like. And so we are going to compare those three different maps, three different styles of comments in the forums, and we're going to see if the hypothesis is that the deliberatorium will develop dialogues and conversations that are more intellectually humble um, than polis, which will be more intellectually humble than the regular forum. We hypothesize that having, people, having the empathy inducement will also lead to more intellectually humble conversations across the three platforms. And before I finish up, we're good on time, right? Before I finish up, I do have to put a shout out. This did we, in addition to Michael and Brendan and the, the, the Templeton Foundation, I also received money from the Bennett Foundation, or the Bennett Fellowship Foundation, which is for honors students of political science, and the Office for Undergraduate Research here at UConn. And I'm gonna, Brendan Rogers, I got I to gotta embarrass them a little bit. This is Brendan Rogers and Addison Kimball, hey. who were moderating the And if you want to know anything about moderation, Addison was one of our moderators and got to deal with all the, the people and all some of their not so nice comments you can ask me. Whereas, whereas Brendan just reminded me he had to deal with ethics. Well, yeah. Brendan had to deal with ethics, yeah, that that's was right. all. Okay, Mike. Thank you. So while that's getting set up, I'll just get started. Um, this project uh, had a bunch of different parts. Um, I'm going to tell you one of the, about one of them in detail, uh, but I'll just briefly mention the others. Um, uh, I wrote a paper with Neil Levy on uh, the ways in which we can acquire knowledge from intellectual vices like uh, over-imitation and dogmatism. That is coming out in mind in a, a few weeks. Uh, I wrote a paper with uh, Adam Carter and Mark Chiang of, titled uh, Technological <coughs> Seduction and Self-Radicalization, which is about uh, how YouTube makes people into Nazis. Um, <laughs> wrote uh, a paper with my postdoc, Emily Sullivan, on uh, the value of negative <coughs> epistemic exemplars. If you're familiar with the exemplars literature, you'll know that the, the primary model that's used there is uh, the sort of admiration emulation uh, approach. And that requires really, really good epistemic exemplars. And we were interested in like 
well, what can we learn from people who aren't so good? Um, and we argue, at least, that there's a lot to be learned. Um, I've also uh, uh, written with uh, Emily uh, and uh, a computer scientist uh, by the name of Nava Tintarev, uh, a paper uh, that's still in draft form on uh, motivated numeracy. So if you know Dan Cahan's work on motivated numeracy, we basically uh, did a conceptual replication of that. He did a, a version of it with um, the gun control debate in the United States, um, and that's not something that you can uh, replicate directly in Europe because even the conservatives are like, of course there shouldn't be so many guns. Um, so we did it with immigration uh, because lots of Europeans are racist. Um, <laughs> So we're interested in seeing how that works out. It, it looks like we mostly replicate Cahan's findings, but we have to do a little more analysis with that. Um, we also ran two uh, master classes on network analytic uh, techniques and methods for philosophers. Uh, I think that um, experimental philosophy is sort of growing up uh, nowadays, and we don't only have to imitate social psych psychologists, we can also imitate computer scientists. Um, and that's what I'm going to be telling you about in just a minute. Um, and we ran uh, a workshop at the ZIF, the Center for Interdisciplinary uh, Studies in Bielefeld, Germany, uh, <coughs> on uh, the epistemology uh, of uh, machine learning, essentially looking at the problem of explainability uh, in AI. Um, but this paper that I'm going to tell you about now is sort of the crown jewel of the project. Uh, it's forthcoming in Oxford Studies in Experimental Philosophy. Um, and the basic idea behind uh, this work is um, you can think of intellectual humility as a, uh, embodied in uh, a trait that's embodied in individuals that's expressed in the ways that they handle, for instance, disagreement with a peer or with someone who's above them or below them in some kind of hierarchy, either epistemic or otherwise. Um, but we wanted to kind of zoom out and ask, well, could it be that part of what it takes to be intellectually humble is to, to monitor the structure of the testimonial network that you find yourself in and make sure that you're hearing from multiple independent diverse sources on the topics that you care about? Um, this is related to the problem of the so-called filter bubble, uh, which is an interesting metaphor but hasn't been uh, uh, theorized or formalized very carefully we developed a, uh, a method for uh, mathematically determining uh, the epistemic position of every node in a social network that essentially says uh, to what extent that node is in a position to, uh, to hear from multiple independent diverse sources, uh, which if you're familiar with like, the Condorcet jury theorem or uh, the wisdom of crowds literature, you know is, is really important. Um, we wanted to try this out on a variety of platforms. In the end, we only used Twitter, partly because of GDPR, um, and partly because uh, the Facebook API is no longer really useful for, for research. Um, and we looked at uh, the Anglophone discourse around uh, a variety of different controversial, controversial topics. So we looked at the uh, Twitter discourse about abortion, about Islam and Islamophobia, about gay marriage, about climate change, about uh, genetically modified organisms, something we heard about yesterday, uh, about police brutality. Um, we were already monitoring uh, uh, discourse about uh, sexual harassment and sexual assault when the Me Too hashtag sort of went viral. Uh, so we have a natural experiment built into our longitudinal data set, which is pretty cool. Um, and we looked at discourse about I income and wealth inequality, and then finally, uh, uh, vaccine safety. And I'm going to show you the, the results for the vaccine safety work. Um, we're also now following up with uh, an analysis of the discourse about uh, Dutch politics, including uh, one bit that's about uh, the, the parties. There's like 13 parties in the Netherlands, uh, including one named 50 Plus, which is like a genera generational warfare party. Um, <laughs> And we're also looking at the, the Spark to Piet controversy. Um, so if you know anything about what happens in the Netherlands in November, you'll be aware that all of a sudden these lovely, liberal, tolerant people suddenly are in blackface and minstrel outfits. Um, and they think it's fine. Or at least some of them do. 
so we're, we're monitoring the discourse about that as well. Um, we tried to get controversies that were sort of part of sort of traditional political polarization, uh, but also ones that are not. So uh, the vaccine safety and the GMO ones were meant to be controversies that are not uh, polarized along the right-left sort of political axis. To some extent, they're be becoming that way, but they were the best uh, options that we were, we were able to find. Okay, so the, the essential question that we wanted to ask is, um, are we in a position where we're, uh, where we have a kind of epistemic utopia where we can learn from the wisdom of crowds, or have we set up our epistemic networks more for like the madness of masses, the, the, the filter bubbles and the polarization that everybody talks about but nobody has a formal model of? Um, and at least for vaccine safety, um, the answer is pessimistic. Um, now, the, the idea behind this um, was uh, starting from this idea of like an epistemic state of nature. Now suppose you're just, you're alone in the Garden of Eden and you're, you're wandering around, you're exploring things, you're, you're learning from your environment, that's cool. But you know, you're finite, you sleep sometimes, uh, you, you, you can't run that fast, uh, and so on. Uh, so it's useful to have informants, right? And if you're familiar with this epistemic state of nature kind of thought experiment, the idea is like, well, what we need to do is find trustworthy informants. Uh, and, and that's what a lot of people in social epistemology have been focusing on, right? So, so Eve here in the epistemic uh, state of nature, she might go and get herself a source, right? And now Adam wanders around and learns things and he tells her what he's learned and she also wanders around and, and learns things on her own. So that's cool. But, you know, Adam is maybe not the smartest uh, and he's also finite. So what Eve might want is, you know, more sources. Right, so she goes and she finds further people who seem trustworthy enough, uh, and they, they tell her things. So now we're in, in a, Eve is in an even better epistemic position. She has multiple sources. Now, here's the thing. What if um, her three new sources are all just amplifying some, some third party, some fourth, this, a fifth individual in this case? This might, be a problem because if uh, if Eve, for instance, is unsure about whether some proposition is true or something is good, and she's trying to use her social network to uh, address that question, right? She might, for instance, use like a majority vote. So Adam says yes. The three purple nodes say no. She's like, I don't know. They seem all right. Three is more than one. So I go with what they say. But if really all they're doing is amplifying some. Uh, one additional source, then it's not that Eve has four sources, essentially she has two. One being Adam, the other being Lucifer who's megaphoning her with these, uh, uh, these intermediaries. So what, uh, what Eve needs is uh, independent sources, not just multiple sources, but sources that are not just amplifying some message at her. Now, uh, Amplification can be sort of organic, and uh, it, it might be that uh, Lucifer here actually doesn't have any bad intentions. Uh, but it can also be the case that somebody is intentionally trying to mess with your social epistemic network to get you to believe things or to doubt things that you wouldn't otherwise doubt or believe, not because they <coughs> want you to believe the truth and avoid error, but because they have some ulterior motive. Um, so what, what does Eve need to do? Well, she needs to monitor the structure of her network. And this is something I think that's really important and is basically neglected in social epistemology. Um, uh, in, in social epistemology, um, people talk about finding trustworthy sources. So it's all about assessing the individual. But in addition to that, it's important to assess the structure of the network itself because that is uh, the way that you avoid uh, amplification, or at least allow yourself to deal with the fact that you've got a message being amplified in your direction. Um, and it might make it possible also to ameliorate the structure of the network. So Eve might say, you know what, I need even more sources, and I need to make sure that they're independent of this megaphone that's coming from Lucifer here. Right, so monitoring the structure of the network makes it possible to adjust your credences so that you don't let the, the amplified voices outweigh everybody else, and it also makes it possible to intervene on the structure of the network, at least in some cases. Okay, so 
there we go. Um, this means that there's uh, sort of three families of social epistemic receiver virtues. There's the, the monitoring ones, where you just keep track of the structure. There's the adjusting ones, where you, you change your credences in light of flaws in the structure. And there's the ameliorating ones, where you're, uh, you're disposed to make interventions on the structure, to change it, to either add links or delete links. Um, and this means, in addition, that it, it's probably worthwhile to think not just of the dispositions needed by receivers, but also dispositions that would be valuable in sources, in conduits, and in echoes. Um, and I think like we've all seen like um, emails that get forwarded to us that we shouldn't be forwarded, or people sharing fake news on on, on Facebook or Twitter, um, and saying like, "Come on, Uncle, stop doing that. You know you, you shouldn't be sharing this stuff." Right? That's essentially some, someone who is disposed to do that has a conduit vice. They're, they're bad at being an epistemic conduit. Okay, so that's, oh, that's fun. Um, um, so that's uh, the, the sort of theoretical structure. Now here's the mathematical structure. We came up with the, uh, the idea of um, first a K observer. A K observer is just a node in a network that hears from K other nodes. And hears from in Twitter means retweets at least once. Um, in other social networks, it would, it would, you would have to use other indicators. Um, but that only gets you the multiplicity. What you want is multiple independent sources. So an MK observer is, one, uh, is a node where they've got K sources, each of which is at a distance of at least M from each of the other sources. So for instance, here we have a 3-2 observer. The red node is a 3-2 observer because it's hearing from the three blue nodes. Now you might see, okay, well, what about this white one? Well, the white one's only a distance of one from this blue node. So this is a 4-1 observer. Sorry, yeah, 4-1 observer, and also a 3-2 observer. And what we do is we multiply the M and the K values to, uh, uh, to get a rough estimate of someone's epistemic position in the network, right? So if you want multiple and independent sources, you might think, well, <laughs> I have five sources, but they're not very independent, or I have three sources, but they're very independent. Right? Those are two different epistemic positions you might be in. Um, and we thought uh, the, the best uh, way to do this is to sort of take the diagonals and take the product of these two parameters um, and, and treat that as the epistemic position of the, uh, the node. Um, so right to, to actually do this, we had to follow the tweets. Um, we collected uh, uh, data from the Twitter stream API um, in 2017 and 2018 uh, and cleaned it up essentially to uh, remove all of the nodes that were not part of the core of the network, who were actually talking to each other. Um, and we, we were looking at uh, people who used text and hashtags like vax, vaxed, vaccine safety, vaccines work, uh, immunization, and so on. We got 60,000 tweets in 2017, we got even more in 2018. Um, and but then we went and labeled by hand the core <coughs> nodes to see, okay, is this, uh, is this uh, account representing a pro view or a con view or something in the middle? Um, and we had very high inter-reader reliability. Uh, so when you scroll through someone's feed, you can quite easily tell whether they're pro or con. Um, Basically, no one is neutral or mixed. Um, we found only one neutral account, uh, which was uh, a, an account that was talking about like a historical vaccine and had nothing to do with the current debate. Um, so here's what the network looks like. It's a pretty good picture. Um, but that doesn't really tell you anything. Um, here is uh, a representation of the epistemic position of all the nodes in the core of the network. Now, what does that mean? It means. Um, we multiply the M value by the K value, and we also did a topic model on the actual content of what people were saying to see, uh, to, to get something like a measure of diversity. Um, so we actually multiply M by K by D, which is the diversity measure. And we were thinking, what's a good epistemic position to be in? How many sources, how independent should they be? We know that you can get from anyone to anyone in the world in six hops. So that seems like too high a, a, an independence number. Um, so we decided that 
essentially having a 3-3 observer hearing from three different sources, each of which is the distance of at least three from each of the others, would be a, an adequate threshold. Um, and basically what this shows is that almost no one in this network is above that threshold. There are a few. Um, here's a, a representation of, uh, of what we found. So there were a couple hundred nodes in the core network. Um, as I said, there's only one that was neutral. And we calculated a couple of centrality metrics for them. So in degree just means the number of people you're hearing from. Out degree is the number of people who hear from you. And then page rank is, is, is essentially the Google algorithm. Um, it, it's the, for, for something like this, it represents, in the case of page rank out, the chance that any random tweet of yours might make it to someone else in the network, mm -hmm. and page rank in represents the chance that any random tweet in the network might make it to you. And what we find is that on uh, three of these four dimensions, the anti-vaxxers win. Mm -hmm. So they talk to each other more, their messages are more likely to go viral, and they're more likely to see uh, tweets about vaccines. Um, Here's another representation of the network. The edges represent links of uh, retweeting in one direction or the other. Uh, we've got the con vaccine folks on the left, the pro on the right. You can see that there's basically no crosstalk. So they're totally in filter bubbles. Um, and the, by far the most um, uh, epistemically powerful node, this is page rank out, so the chance that people hear from you, is this um, homeopathy and anti-vax account that's, uh, we've redacted the name, but it's, it's the, up there at the top left. So that's fun. Um, <laughs> and for page rank in, it looks exactly the same. Um, sorry. Uh, we did another study the next year, also in March. It's important to, to do the same month because there's a seasonality to vaccine. Uh, discourse, mm -hmm. and we found essentially the same thing. There were a few neutral and mixed accounts. Um, there were actually a lot more pro-vaccine accounts in this case, um, and that seemed to be, uh, our impression at least was, uh, that seemed to be because uh, pediatricians got together and organized a campaign on Twitter. So there were more of them, but they had lower out degree, in degree, page rank out, and page rank in. So they didn't necessarily succeed at what they were trying to do. Um, the most prominent pro-vaccine source was the past uh, president of the Australian Medical Association who went by his own name and didn't share a lot of memes. The most prominent pro-vaccine uh, account uh, that was not an official, uh, like a doctor, was some woman in San Francisco who described herself as having two cats and many opinions. Um, and then uh, the anti-vaxxers were big into homeopathy raw, whole, and organic food, shared mostly memes uh, and videos. Um, sorry. Uh, that's the, the, the second year uh, picture, and it's essentially the same as the first year. There's a few more in the middle, but not many. Uh, and it's basically the same picture for page rank in and for page rank out. So, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, Institute. Uh, thank you, audience. Um, Linus Pauling uh, actually has uh, one of the most interesting credentials known to the human race. He's the only person who won the Nobel uh, Prize twice alone. Uh, but that's not m uh, how most people know him. Most people know him from his later, I'll uh, use quotations, work in which he uh, promoted the idea that high uh, doses of vitamin C would actually affect colds, uh, would render them um, uh, uh, would, would render them mute, if you will. Um, uh, Sixteen independent studies were done on that and found no evidence of that, uh, though there, the meme continues to this day. In the mid-1970s, uh, he promoted the idea that high doses of vaccine would actually cure cancer. Uh, that was later retracted, and if you actually go to the Linus Pauling Institute at Oregon State University, you'll see that retraction about cancer. 
Uh, actually, you'll see a lot of great useful information about micronutrients, but the meme that um, uh, high doses of, orange, uh, of uh, uh, vitamin C will actually cure colds is still on their website, uh, even after the biological community and the medical community has discounted it greatly to uh, completely, if you will. And that's what I want to talk about today uh, in terms of the project that we were doing um, uh, uh, in relation to this project uh, in uh, collaboration with uh, Nathan Ballantyne of the Theoretical End. He's a, a philosopher. And the empirical stuff I'll talk about today, um, uh, my partner was Stephanie Chen, uh, who's now with uh, Facebook, unfortunately. Uh, but what we were interested in was the idea of epistemic trespassing, which is essentially the idea, and Linus Pauling is the best example of this, of thinkers or intellectuals who have competence or expertise to make good judgment in one field, um, uh, like chemistry, for example, who move over to another field where they lack confidence and pass judgment ne nevertheless. And you can think of many examples of people who move from one field to another field where they may not necessarily have had sufficient training. As a psychologist, I experience this monthly. Uh, I can imagine that philosophers also experience it quite often. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson comes to mind, for example. Uh, that's, but if you take a look at epistemic trespassing, it sort of happens via two different avenues, uh, separate avenues that Nathan and I have been looking at. One is experts in one area who feel they have enough competence to um, uh, comment on another field, uh, professional to professional. Uh, the other way in which it happens, and the, another way in which it's happening more and more, are lay people who feel they have the competence to step into the world of experts and pass judgment in what uh, they have to say. Uh, for example, if I, uh, I'll give you this example. These are data that was published by Matt Moda and his crew in 2018. Uh, their, um, <clears throat> uh, their topic was vaccination. And in the survey, about 1,300 respondents, uh, Americans, 36% said they knew as much or more than doctors about the causes of autism. Uh, and 34% say that they knew just as much, if not more, than scientists. And this matter, if you call this phenomenon overconfidence, and that's what the Moda team called it, um, it turned out that the people who were expressing this level of overconfidence, uh, overconfidence were those with the lowest level of knowledge, it turned out, about autism, and the highest level of misinformation about autism. And they also expressed the most opposition to mandatory vaccination, and also endorsed the idea of non-professional uh, experts coming in, celebrities, if you will. Uh, they should come into the debate and have their own say. Uh, and so uh, what uh, Nathan and I have been wondering about is what causes um, epistemic trespassing, what are the dangers and potential goods of epistemic trespassing, uh, and when need be, how might you uh, prevent it, if you will. Now, let me just go quickly. I, I feel like I have to represent uh, Nathan a little bit and talk about the current uh, conceptual puzzle that he's working on. I'm not going to do it well, so I'll do it quickly. Uh, because one of the questions you can have in this realm of epistemic trespassing, if people do trespass, let's say, into your field, is how do you become a humble but credible expert? That is, you don't want to become uh, overly confident yourself in what you have to say, but you have to be credible in a world that rewards confidence. And quite frankly, the social world, uh, world does uh, award confidence. Uh, I say that confidently so that you'll believe me. <laughs> and the question is, how exactly do you do that? And as I mentioned before, when uh, outward expressions of humility might uh, do damage to your credibility. And if you take a look at the data that are out there, what you find is that people are much more, conf confidence is the criterion that people use to judge whether or not they should follow others. Whether or not it's a true indicator or a red herring of an indicator. Well, what, how might a humble expert solve this problem? Well, one way, potentially, a humble expert can solve this problem, retaining their humility that being credible is by adopting a, um, uh, a strategy of dualism, which is that you can be humble privately and make sure that you're humble privately, but make sure that your uh, public pronouncements are confident. Uh, for those of you who know, this is called being a doctor. Uh, this is how your doctor is trained. Uh, because doctors know that they have to pay attention to a lot of differential diagnoses by training they are humble in terms of their diagnoses, but they know whatever they tell you might be wrong, 
but it's more likely to be right, so they're going to be absolutely confident that you should follow their regimen. And this actually happened to me uh, a couple of summers ago when I presented a series of symptoms to a doctor that quite frankly looked like Lyme disease. And uh, I lived in upstate New York for 30 years, so oh, it has to be Lyme disease. So immediately she put me on the antibiotic regimen. I was very confident I had to follow this regimen. And then sneakily ordered all these tests for me uh, that, uh, and tested 20 different other diagnoses of what would be going on. And it turned out that the next week when the blood test came back, I had a very common uh, condition that actually expresses itself in a very wacky way. She was both publicly, hum excuse me, uh, publicly confident but privately humble. And in my case, that worked out quite well. Um, <laughs> better than my former doctor, uh, who just would listen to what I had to say when he came in and said, I, I think I have X, the medication is Y, he'd go, okay. <laughs> he, he didn't mind my trespassing. Um, the other way that potentially you can uh, deal with uh, trying to become a humble expert is through advantageous sincerity, where you try to be candid about your limits, but do so in ways that will maintain or boost credibility. Now, there are a number of ways you can do that in social psychology. I don't want to go through the lecture I could give, but there are a number of tactics that you can use to be true, but also remain uh, an expert in the eyes of the person. And finally, you can retreat. And this one, uh, don't ask me to defend it, ask Nathan, uh, <laughs> which is humble experts can delegate public communication to experts in getting the scientific message out and then avoid um, making da damaging admonitions or, or, or damaging um, qualifications about uh, expert knowledge. I don't know about that, but uh, the, uh, Nathan is confident. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I wonder what I talk about is Nathan, uh, being a philosopher, I think he's doing uh, what I consider is uh, the, the philosophical tendency to take a look at the top experts and think how can uh, experts better uh, perform their role in society, top down. Uh, I'm a social psychologist, so I tend to think bottom up, which is I tend to think about uh, everyday people, lay people, and what is their role in this process, and what should we do when we think about lay people, especially those who now uh, really, uh, to a great extent, are beginning to uh, trespass into the role of experts. More and more people are coming with their doctors like me, saying, I think I have X, the medication is Y. Uh, Google has, uh, <coughs> excuse me, certainly promoted that. Uh, you have many people who are not expressing, well, not necessarily a increased distrust in science, but a pretty hefty distrust in science, what science might have to say. Now, these are Pew data that go back to 1973, and what they show is that uh, the good news is for science is since 1973, uh, trust in science has remained low. Uh, the bad news is that if you ask, okay, how many people have a good or a fair amount of trust in science, it's around 40%. There are a number of people who have their doubts. Yeah. And there are some particular uh, areas where some very important people have their doubts. Let's turn to vaccination, for example. Uh, we find that overall, according to Pew data, about 9% of people have very severe doubts about uh, what science has to say about vaccination. The key, though, is the group that um, uh, expresses the most doubt are those between the ages of 18 and 29. You can imagine those people are having children. About 50% of them, one in six, one in seven, is expressing severe doubt about the science, what science has to say about vaccination. And of course, you go to climate change, you can find tremendous political polarization to what extent uh, conservatives and liberals accept the scientific consensus on climate change. And what I've been interested in is what underlies the lack of trust in science. And is there anything you can do to promote trust in science? After all, I kind of do science and would like people <laughs> to pay attention to what I have to say, at least occasionally. Uh, well, what can we say about why people may distrust science? Well, to tell you the truth, um, one of the most interesting and profound findings I've seen in the past 10 years uh, it's through the work of Andrew uh, Schulman, uh, he's at Occidental College, where what he's looked at is the epistemic basis for people's belief in science versus the supernatural. Uh, why do people believe in oxygen, for example, or electrons, for example, we've never seen them, uh, versus why do people believe in ghosts in heaven, for example. And what he's determined is if you take a look at people's epistemic basis for believing in scientific concepts versus supernatural concepts, what he finds is they're identical. 
That is, people believe uh, in either type of concept because they've had some high priest, maybe in front of their sophomore class, stand up in front of them and proclaim that this concept exists. That is, they listen to other people's testimony. They defer to experts, teachers, uh, priests, uh, their uncle, their parents, school teachers, and they defer to what they think most people think of. Um, their belief comes from a social place. It doesn't come from where a scientist believes, belief should come from, from an empirical place from the rigorous testing of data to see those data show patterns that allow us to justify the conclusions that we want to reach. And uh, if you think about the fact that a lot of people, for them, what science is, is something that is a product of testimony, that allows them to start to think that scientists, in some sense, are basically, or at least a grand plurality of people, are allowed to say anything they want to say. And if you ask people, we have an MTurk studies, uh, whether they think that scientists think the best experiment is one that will support their idea. Uh, you can prove anything you want with statistics. Scientific agreement about some conclusion is suspicious because it suggests scientists are concluding with one another. What you find is that there are a plurality of people who believe what scientists do is they sit around, they come up with a conclusion, they handshake on it, and maybe they collect some data to have some window dressing, if you will. If you will. They think the ideas come first, data are merely confirmatory or, or, or rationalization, as opposed to the business, which is torturously trying to come up with data that beyond reasonable doubt can actually support the position you have, or at least that's, that's my uh, idea behind it. Oh, and by the way, this belief that scientists basically are not constrained in, in what they can conclude, that they're not constrained by data, is actually behind in our surveys done on MTurk, uh, so they're not representative. Uh, but they're behind such uh, beliefs in whether or not science can be trusted in terms of its motives, or scientists can be trusted in their motives. Do they have the public interest in mind? Or whether scientists actually have the expertise to be able to make the calls that they make about what is going on in the world. Ignore the fact that there are arrows there. That's a mistake. That's a no-no. So that's just a correlation. For now, those are just correlations you're seeing. Uh, between belief that scientists can say whatever they want and distrust in science, if you will. Um, well, what might be going on here? What might be going on is either a lack of consideration or even a thinking of the fact that scientists are collecting data and depend on data to achieve the authority of their conclusions, or you don't know how hard the business is of collecting data. And so that led us to the following question. Is it, are people who don't understand or don't have a concept of scientific rigor the ones who are allowing themselves to believe that scientists can believe whatever they want, and thus you really don't have to pay attention to what scientists say. So what we did is a number of surveys where we might give people 10 questions like this. Uh, Dr. L is listing herbal remedy for <coughs> headaches. She recruits about 110 people into her study and gives them a particular type of tea packet. She instructs them to, think, uh, to drink the tea uh, the next time they have a headache, and at the end of the study period, all participants reported that their headaches went away within two hours. Uh, should Dr. L conclude that the tea is an effective uh, headache remedy? Uh, is her conclusion warranted? She concludes that, is her conclusion warranted? And we ask people to basically rate from 0% to 100% whether or not they think that conclusion is warranted. Question, is that conclusion warranted? No. no. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. That's right. No, there's no control condition. I'm sorry. That's just to see this is, yeah, no. Nope. Try again. Or, uh, Dr. A is conducting a study about labor times in U.S. hospitals. Women who sign up for the study choose whether to receive an epidural or whether they give birth without one. After they give birth, Dr. A finds that the 40 women who received an epidural had labor that lasted 50 minutes longer than the 33 women who did not. He concludes that the epidurals cause labor to last longer. Is his conclusion warranted? <laughs> On the basis of that, no, because we don't know whether he has collected more information. Well, uh, that's true. What, what's the, uh, before I call, thank you, before I call Phil, what's the big disqualification here? Not randomized. Not randomized. Yeah. Period. Start again. <laughs> so uh, what we did is we gave people a, a quiz, basically testing to what extent they understood these uh, points that uh, data has to survive in order to uh, be considered credible. 
And I just want to show this because people who know my work will know that, well, you get this sort of graph. This is how much people actually did show knowledge of principles of scientific rigor versus how much they thought they knew uh, principles of scientific reasoning and scientific rigor. And if you take a look, most people thought they were above average. This is, these are percentiles I'm putting up in one of our surveys. Most people on average thought they were better than average in knowing. And what's interesting here is the people at the very bottom are showing more com uh, confidence in their knowledge than people who are closer uh, to the middle. Uh, that's a little bit of a surprise, but that we get that study after study after study, uh, survey after survey after survey. Uh, people who don't know much about scientific rigor don't know they know, don't know much. Uh, it's a rerun, I know. Okay. But, but it matters, because if you take a look at what is potentially underlying the belief scientists ha uh, have, they can say whatever they want to say. What's behind it is a lack of knowledge about scientific rigor. And if you take a look, and I forgot to put up the, the Roman statistics here, you run a causal model, you can, uh, a causal model that runs from knowledge of scientific rigor over to trust in scientific motives. Oh, by the way, on things like vaccine research, GMO research, climate change research, and nuclear power research, uh, that's pretty much the causal model that fits the correlational data that we get. Um, well, that's the problem. Is there a way to address it? Well, uh, one way that we've been addressing it is simply by taking people's uh, paucity of scientific knowledge and then running on MTurn about a 20-minute intervention where we present to them these problems, show them what's wrong with them, have them write down their understanding of what's wrong with them, retest them, and tell them a little bit more about the scientific process, like uh, to publish their findings, scientists have to submit their work to review by other scientists, a process known as peer review, in peer review, a panel of anonymous scientists inspect the logic and procedure of the research under submission. If they reveal any problems or violations of the rules, the scientists must go back to <coughs> see if their idea survives a more rigorous uh, training. So we basically tell them what our job is, if you will. We try to fill in the hole of what we don't know. And what we find is this intervention. Well, here, okay, here's my true attitude. It worked. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> that is, uh, if we ask uh, uh, people, do they believe scientists can say anything, they're much less likely to say that after the intervention relative to a control condition. Uh, they trust in the motives of scientists, whether or not they have society's uh, benefit at heart, much more. And they also believe in science as well as scientists. Mm -hmm. They believe in the process. They believe that rogues can be caught, if you will, much more than they previously would have thought. The only thing they don't think is that they don't think scientists are any more competent than they were before. Well, our intervention is showing a bunch of scientists making mistakes, naturally. Um, but what this suggests is that there is a certain type of science literacy that people don't have, or a certain conception of science that people don't have. If you can successfully fill in that hole, you do have a shot at potentially making people more likely to express trust in science. And we're going to take a look to see if that actually will extend to uh, specific situations. Uh, let me just end, uh, end there and just mention the other uh, fact where Nathan and I are coming together. Uh, we may, many people may not trust scientists, but the real problem is scientists don't trust each other. Uh, psychologists don't really think econ economists have it right. Economists don't think. Sociologists have it right, sociologists don't think philosophers have it right, philosophers worry about um, uh, anthropology, and so we all potentially fall prey to what I'm going to call disciplinary chauvinism, because we know the rules of rigor in our own fields, but we're not aware of the uh, rigor as it is, is expressed in other fields. I guess I'm done there, so I'll end. All right. about the um, MK observer um, measure. Uh, why retweets only? So why not favorites to um, or replies? I mean, both seem to indicate that the person saw it. Right. Um, not, not likes or loves because the metadata don't allow us to figure out who loved what. Yep. So just data collection. Um, retweets tend to express agreement whereas replies tend to express disagreement. It's a rough heuristic. Um, we, we do have the reply networks, but it's harder to know what to make of them because if you know somebody shares a, a, a tweet about vaccine safety and then I 
quickly reply, like, I hope you and your children die of measles, um, which I've seen. Um, does that really mean that I paid attention and had a chance to learn from them, or that I'm just sort of expressing negative sentiments? But you don't have a way to distinguish between true re or between retweets and uh, the comment version of a retweet, right? Or does right. the metadata so, allow so you to do that? We can. Um, okay. So you, you can, you can, we can partial out um, uh, pure retweets and retweet with comment. Yep. Um, because sometimes the latter is like a dunk. Yeah, it's a form of ratioing. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, we've we looked at that and it doesn't seem to make a difference. Okay, cool. Uh, Heather? Yeah, thanks to all of your really cool work that you're all doing. Um, my question's for David. Fascinating stuff. So after, uh, after the intervention, mm -hmm. were you able to see, were you able to test them more than once to see if that response stuck around? Okay. No, yeah, that, that's work we have to do. Uh, we have, there, there are two th I don't want to oversell the intervention, other than the fact that it worked. Um, uh, <laughs> to my surprise. Yeah. Uh, because intervention work is hard, especially when you try to do it over enter in that kind of yeah. environment that tends to be very difficult. At least we've found it in, in, my, in my lab. <laughs> But uh, we're trying to see if this will extend to um, trust in specific statements that are made by scientists. Uh, for example, like in op-eds, uh, those data are coming in right now. And then we're going to take a look at, at time frame because you're absolutely right. Uh, certain interventions only have an elastic impact, and we want to see how much of an elastic impact uh, this has. Yeah, great. Thanks, uh, Walter. So I want to ask Mark about uh, independence because I, I just I, maybe I don't understand, but it seems like you could have you know five people starting off the chain of retweets, but they all saw the same television show, uh, or they all go, oh yeah, you know, I saw him lie, I saw him lie, I saw him lie. You don't know whether it was the same lie, and they all saw it, or whether it was different lies. And so if you conclude he's a liar, you don't know whether you've got good evidence or not. Uh, and so, how do you build that into the model? I don't, I'm not really sure how you dealt with dependence versus independence. Yeah. Because all you had was independence of other tweeters. Right. Not you didn't have any information about the source of where the first tweet in the chain came from. Right. No, that that's exactly right. So, um, that's a serious limitation with this methodology. Um, it's even harder to get a picture of a, a real life social network. Um, so, that's. That's a limitation, but it's it's the the best we can do. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know a better way to do it. Yeah, it's a real problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so you can get people's like follower lists, um, but that requires the static API, which is really slow, or ten thousand dollars a month. Um, <laughs> For both. <laughs> you no, know, if you pay, it's fast. But um, I'm working with Nava Tintarev, who is. Um, working on a grant from Twitter and she's going to get access to their fire hose for free. So we might be able to, to look at that um, in the future, but with this research we, we just can't. Uh, more? Yeah, um, David, did you ask people um, questions um, along the lines of the Dr. A, Dr. L, or were you targeting, were you able to target Ish, scientific issues that meant something to people. So I can see mm. that, you know, the intervention about Dr. A epidurals, oh yeah, they made a mistake. But, you know, if you give me an example about the vaccinations, and I already strongly believe that, mm -hmm. isn't it, were you able to measure whether that intervention uh, worked there? We have looked to see to what extent the intervention has an impact, um, basically people who are already sort of favorable-esque to <laughs> vaccination versus <laughs> An opponent, and basically what we what we see is just a general uplifting uh, for both groups, okay. if you will. Yeah. So the intervention seems to work um, equally well, no matter where the starting point okay. the person uh, uh, a person is. Um, uh, and uh, but uh, well, a couple of different a couple of different things were, were rather comprehensive in terms of measuring a person's knowledge mm -hmm. about scientific rigor. And the second thing is the, the intervention does is interactive and does sort of pound in the idea that there is this thing that scientists do and they can't say it until they've convinced their colleagues. Mm -hmm. And that was a key point that we wanted to make. Okay, and people seem to take that home. Huh. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Michael? Hey, uh, really great stuff from all of you. My question though, that, well I have lots of questions, I have questions, but I'm only gonna ask sort of one of, which is both of Graham and Michael and Mark. So, one of the things I'm interested in, in both your projects is the extent to which 
and it, this would play out in different ways on your projects, I, I think. Um, we can, often when people express things online, and Mark just alluded to this, sometimes they can seem to be expressing what um, their, their belief, their, their, their views about a, a matter. And in one sense, we might say they really are doing that. But they might also be, the might prime function of that expression that might look like a statement and an argument or something like that, if the actual function that is playing for them cognitively and also perhaps in the discourse is an, uh, an emotive one, mm -hmm. right? And for Mark, I think this, the, the problem is, well, this is supposed to be a social network that's talking about epistemic hierarchies and, and trust, right? But if a lot of the, the communication that's going on is only masquerading as epistemic, but is actually really just expression of outrage, this example that you just noted, yeah. uh, then it's hard to know how to read into it. In the online commenting, I mean, some of the platforms that allow you to, for example, <coughs> say, I agree or I disagree, or I don't know, I need more information, those, those buttons can in themselves be used expressively. You know, agree can turn out to be like, yeah. Uh, disagree can be like, boo, right? Where, where you're not really expressing a considered opinion, or it might be more, you know, uh, nastier words than that, right? Um, to close with a slight anecdote. I was uh, privileged enough, I guess that would be the word, uh, to have dinner uh, and drinks with some executives, vice, vice presidents at some of the platforms we've been talking about at one point, uh, and uh, who were in various roles. And I talked to them about the idea of like, gee, we were talking about Facebook, could we, what, what would happen if we, instead of the emoticons, we just used, you know, uh, justified, when we shared something, we have the following choices uh, that we could respond to the share, justified by the evidence, not justified by the evidence, and need more information. <laughs> They thought that was hilarious, and they sort of they joked about that for hours. They thought that was the funniest thing, and the cutest little thing anybody had ever said. And they passed me on my page, and they me on my page, right? Uh, and, but I've come to think that actually they were quite right to treat my view with such, well, yeah, right, uh, disdain would be too strong of a word, but let's just say they didn't take it seriously. And one reason for that is that you could easily see the sorts of platform, even the best one that you're, you hypothesize is going to work, being taken over. You know, basically, what, without saying it, what I think what these executives thought is that, well, look, kid, justified by the evidence is just going to become like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that's how social networks work. Yeah. Kid. So I wasn't a kid, but they sort of were treating me like, you know, appropriately so. It's a baby. So I, I throw that out to both of you because I think it's a, po a problem that I'd like to hear what you guys have to say. <coughs> okay. Um, I'm not going to respond exactly directly to it, but you've you, you, you kind of landed on a, an issue I have in relation to the to institutional design online and yeah. I think we were talking about this over lunch some of us who come from a face-to-face -face tradition you know we, we, we built our face-to-face -face technologies in order to be able to tease out this stuff and that's how it works and it's really hard to think how these kind of dimen you know so you you're, you're clicking that button in a face-to-face -face environment I can kind of try and figure that out you know and online we just haven't got the you know, we don't have the dimension we don't know how to deal with that kind of dimensionality of different responses I think this is a real problem one of the problems in this space is it's really captured by civic tech people, kind of solutionists, who kind of have no idea about social psychology, no idea about democracy. I think that's part of the problem. We, we're running too fast at the moment. We can't, we can't stop it, but it's a, it is a real problem. We've, we've spent years figuring out the face-to-face -face dynamics, and we're using this very simplified technology. So I, I completely agree with what you're, say, what you're saying, and I think all sorts of things are happening online which are just misunderstandings because of the way the technology is structured. I'm not, I'm not sure how to, so I kind of agree, and I have, but I have no, no positive way of responding to you. Right. Just one, sorry, one other quick question. With the, with the deliberatorium, it's built, off, built, and this is kind of like, again, the solution is kind of, it's someone who's very committed to informal logic, and so you, know, you get, he wants reasoned answers, that, you know, reasoned pros, reasoned cons, and someone said to him, what about the emotional stuff? He said, oh, let's create an, Let's create a, a chat line on the side, and they can do the emotional stuff over there. 
you know, it, it's like, yeah. I mean, that, that, and, but that, that's, actually, that's how people think, you know, how some of these tech people think. So. <laughs> right. Um, did you, sorry, did you want to say something? Oh. I'll just throw, I'll throw another spanner in the works. Why can't it be both? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at our queue that, of the things that didn't make it in, that we moderated out beforehand, and one who says, yes, absolutely, exclamation point. Only a stupid moron would answer in the negative, exclamation point. Which to me is both emotive and making some epistemic claim. So how do you even disentangle whether it's just epistemic, just, a, my own take is it's always, there's a lot of both going on in just about everything, right? I, I'm one of those thinking and feeling are always going together. Sure. And, and so my response might be, well, yeah, but, but, but I, I find that it's often not one or the other. Right. You know? So I'm saying yay, but I'm saying yay because I've thought about that and that, you know. But I'm not sure you can make that up. I mean, uh -huh. it's hard to tease out. You're absolutely right. Yeah, super hard. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, here's here's a solution. We just train everyone in speech act theory, and then they have to include <laughs> <laughs> the metadata of every comment they make, whether it's an assertion, a declaration. That's, a, that's what Mark Klein actually thinks he can do with the software. Yeah, this is not going to work. <laughs> that, that so would, yeah. Until you can hear the person's tone of voice, yeah. you I, have no idea yeah. what they're really trying to communicate. <laughs> yeah, so. It's a problem, and um, in natural language processing, there's there's tons of cool stuff being done, um, but one of the hardest challenges in natural language processing is sarcasm detection. Sarcasm. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes. Exactly. So if you don't know whether to insert a not in in front of what someone said, uh, you're in really bad shape. Um, so I, I think that we we don't have the civic education that will fix this, and we're not going to have it, and at least the technology right now is not up to the, the task. Um, one p potential solution <coughs> is having more um, differentiation of communities, so like you could imagine like ep epistemic Facebook, and then like cat video Facebook. <laughs> and if, if you want cat videos, you go to that one, and then you can click the, the joy button or whatever. And if you actually want to have a reasoned discussion, then you go to the epistemic Facebook. And there are Which would make a lot of money for <laughs> <laughs> That would be the one everybody would be crowding in. Well, but I, I think that there's not, there's something to this. So if you look at like the subreddit, uh, Change My View, uh -huh. um, they, that's specifically an epistemic community. They have a whole point system where if you actually manage to, to change my view, I award you a delta for change. Yeah. And you know, people compete for deltas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there, there's also a, a community built around this um, web app uh, plugin called Rebutter, where it's a similar kind of thing. So if, if you either get people who care about these things or people who care about these things right now uh, to talk to each other in a reasoned way, that might help. Um, now, will the trolls come in? If it gets big enough, probably. So it might be hopeless. Is, is yeah, there's, a, there's, yeah, there's just one independent point I want to make. Uh, every new piece of communication technology has created an era of normlessness, mm -hmm. which becomes the wild, wild west. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of misunderstanding. Sure. So in some sense, we're talking about norms that are being imposed, if you will, from the top. Norms also have to be imposed from the bottom. So when the telephone came in, yeah. It took a few years for people to realize, oh, I actually should listen in to the other people's conversation on the party line, right. for example. So there is a time where there is incivility, and then things sort out. Um, uh, will it happen this time? Who knows? But uh, we've been here before. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Lenny? Oh, thanks. Yeah, so um, Mark, it's just a question about the social networks and whether and to what extent you think that, that the research you're doing there could um, speak to, give us an insight into, or alternatively learn from the kind of more real, uh, not real world, um, social networks offline. Um, but in particular, I'm thinking about, you know, traditional newspaper media sources, where that seems to be um, a an issue that has been like discussed in the background of how journalists should operate 
that they should be getting independent, multiple, diverse, independent sources, and often they're not doing that, and then that's creating the same kind of effect where you know you end you end up in your real life social network having a conversation over a glass of wine where someone's read the independent article, someone's read the Guardian article, they both say the same thing. You think you've got independent sources, but actually the journalists, you know, have that all if you all trace it all the way back, then you end up with just like one source and it's very hard to know at that point whether or not it's reliable. Yeah. So I guess yeah the question is twofold whether or not you know you think that the social network online social network situation is like worse because it's online and whether we could learn something from that structure that you're mapping. Um, and vice versa, where we could learn something about how to diagnose what's going on from the work that's been done in like professional context, so that's an issue. Yeah, um, I'll say a few things. So one is, I've looked at like the Reuters and Associated Press guidelines, um, and they don't say to get multiple independent sources. They do say to get multiple sources, huh. and not anonymous if you can get it. But they actually don't pay attention to the structure of the network, which seems to me to be bad practice. Yeah. Um, Another thing I'd say is we don't know whether filter bubbles are worse in real life or online. Yeah. Um, it, it's easy to assume that the new thing is bad, but um, you know traditional tight knit communities also are having measles outbreaks, and they're not having them because they saw something on Facebook. They're having them because everybody at the synagogue uh, heard from someone who said, you know, my child got autism from the vaccine. Um, so it's not clear to me, it, it's easier to study them online, and that might me mean that we end up saying, well, this is bad, so something else must be better, but we don't know that. Um, the, the solutionist answer is uh, blockchain. So if you could see, if you could actually trace back everything that you were seeing to its origin, then you could, uh, especially if you could do this auto automatically, then you could see, like, okay, I just read these three articles. Are they actually independent? Um, is that going to happen, or is it all going to be initial coin offerings that are Ponzi schemes? Probably it'll be the Ponzi schemes. <laughs> but th there is a possibility there. Brendan? So my question is for David. Um, I've had the, I suppose we call it privilege, to know uh, quite a number of anti-vaxxers who are suspicious of the medical profession and really from two different positions. It's kind of uh, just the, start of the anecdote one, having homeschooled my kids. Um, uh, so I'll out myself there, folks. There we are. Um, uh, but I also work for the American College of Physicians and mm -hmm. I was uh, the research gopher on the first guidelines for lung disease mm -hmm. and so interacted with patient groups, uh, which was an educational experience. And most of the people that I've encountered who, uh, you know, and this, you know, anti-vaxxer has sort of come up uh, a number of times, and most of the people that I've interacted with, it's not so much they have a distrust in science, or at least that's not what they say, but what they have a distrust in is the kind of distorting effects of the intermediaries. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we can kind of crudely say this is uh, capitalist or economic interest. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's not so much it's the science they distrust, but they just trust big pharma or the salesman. And they have lots of examples that they can point out. It's like, well, mm -hmm. someone told me to live on was okay. Or you could expand that out. And mm -hmm. we thought DDT was okay. Mm -hmm. um, and we now have the opioid crisis. And mm -hmm. they can point to uh, things like Tuskegee. So, I mean, they have very historical, uh, you know, there's historical precedent that they can point to. Mm -hmm. And so I just wonder how, like, how do you respond to that? Well, uh, in any group, uh, there's always going to be a botany, if you will, of uh, syndromes that cause either um, being favorable or being opposed to. So um, one of the things we discovered is that people seem to be unclear or they have a model of science that turns out to be incorrect in terms of the relation of data to conclusion, if you will. That's not, that cannot be the only story. There have to be other um, uh, reasons for people to be opposed or different boogie people, if you will, that mm -hmm. they, they can point to a big pharma would exactly be one. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, that, uh, so any solution that one is going to come up with is going to be a partial solution. It will move some people, but not all people. And uh, 
I don't know when you get to people who are, let's say, uh, as firmly committed, if you will, to the position that they have a very well-reasoned argument for their position that involves many actors, if you will, that makes them suspicious of anything coming from any sort of authority, <coughs> that's going to take a different direction, if you will. Um, but uh, there do seem to be other people, though, who are simply anti-vax because when they they just don't give science any weight because they don't understand why they should give science some weight. And we've certainly encountered them in our travels in, in this project, uh, for example. But you're right. Um, with any phenomenon or any group of people, like let's say people are opposed to vaccination, you have to think about it in terms of, of a botany or a taxonomy, and a zoo, if you will, of different syndromes. And, which, uh, and you have to ask sort of which species can I touch, which species can I actually influence, and which species can't I? Uh, and I, and I, uh, I think you've been in touch with a different set of uh, a different set of animals that we've been in touch with it, with our own research. Have you run into anyone who's aware of the replication crisis and key hacking and expresses skepticism for that reason? Oh, on panels, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not in the real world. I mean, uh, that is, it, it's playing, uh, the issue is playing in academia, uh, but. Uh, uh, it's not playing, let's say, for example, with my family, right? So they, because, uh, in order for people to be aware of the replicability crisis, they have to be aware that replication matters. And a lot of people aren't even there yet. Right? <laughs> uh, Alessandra. Right. So my question is about independence, and, and this is not really about, you know, Twitter. And, so I understand why in that context you did it that way, right? But I am not so sold on the importance of independence in, 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 um, when you don't make the simplifying assumption that every source counts as one. I wanted to, to make a joke and say, look, Lucifer was an angel, so it was worth three, right? <laughs> um, <coughs> but the point is, you get my point, right? That in reality, I think sometimes one good source or one expert source is better than two people who know nothing, right? Now, if we grant that, then often in order to know who is worth listening to, you need to have a lot of interaction with them. And so it's not clear to me. Once you stop making this simplifying assumption, whether you wouldn't actually sort of treat the fact that many people believe that person as evidence that that person is worth listening to. Yeah. So the fact that there isn't independence is actually evidence of the worthiness of the source. Because with the, with the probability theory, it goes either way, right? Well, you know is that if you hear from three sources that come from the same source, the probability of being true is the same as the one source. But you can read that in two ways. Either your trust in the one source goes down, because it's you know, the same, or it goes up, right? You just know that the two are the same. Yeah, so a, a couple things about that. Um, one is there's this really cool work that um, Eric Olson and George Masterton have been <coughs> doing recently that aims to show that if you make certain minimal plausible assumptions about people's ability to determine who's trustworthy, then page rank is actually not just a measure of trustedness, but a trustworthiness. That's super cool. Um, but you do have to make certain assumptions, and maybe those are false. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, there, there's sort of two approaches you could take uh, to your social epistemic life. One is the sort of investigative journalist approach where you're like, all right, I'm going to secure multiple independent diverse sources and I will at home cook up the wisdom of crowds. The other way to do it is to say, I'm going to find someone who will do that for me and I'll just listen to them and treat them as an oracle. Um, and you can have a hybrid strategy, of course. Um, the, the former it takes a lot more effort and is really challenging and, you know, life is short. Um, but the latter makes you dependent on that person. 
Um, and that's a, a risky thing to do, but it's also something that basically we all have to do to some extent. Um, and I, I would just say that knowing that one is, is dependent on someone in that way is really important. Uh, and when the stakes are high enough, you might decide to be the investigative journalist yourself. Uh, Ryan? Oh, um, yeah, so I, I guess, uh, first of all, just because of the discussion of sarcasm, it made me think of, I saw a, a, a presentation, there's a group of Princeton and Wash U political science who are actually using text, or uh, audio analysis to detect these kind of things. Apparently you can uh, to use like tone and get the wave functions in order to detect these. So if you actually have uh, audio data, that would, you know, you, you can get this. But my question, um, so I have a question for Michael and Graham and also a question for Mark. Um, for Michael and Graham, I'm curious, you know, obviously you haven't done the analysis yet, but just in terms of impressions, or maybe I should be asking your moderators, um, one of the knocks on some of these structured technologies is that sometimes people really hate them and drop off. And so I'm curious if you noticed any just apparent more uh, drop-offs with one of your conditions than you did with another. Um, and, and for Mark, I'm curious, so you're, before your analysis, you narrowed down to analyzing the core. And I understand how the, the core detection algorithms work is that they try to get densely interconnected groupings. And so I wonder if one of the potential issues is that the core group is almost by definition going to be a densely interlinked interdependent group um, based on that filtering step and you would find more bridging um, if you included people who are more peripheral to the, the core within the conversation area. He's just got the data up. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we actually have more data than we presented. <laughs> um, obviously, this is very preliminary. <laughs> um, and I was, I, I, I was, I also moderated. So I was, I did quite a number of hours of this. And you're absolutely right. There's some people that hate it. I mean, they, they, they don't like the deliberatorium because they're used to the kind of free form, why are you making me break the, my arguments up? And the, the, there's, yes, we've got them. Some of them hated the articles. Where the articles come from? And some of them thought we were making it up. <laughs> and there were some indications that so they didn't realize, no, no, these are actually <laughs> articles. I mean, they had the author's names there, and that they, um, but I can say that in terms of the number of comments, <laughs> in terms of the number of comments across the eight articles, we had 905 in the forum, we had 901 in the polis, and we had 915 in the delivery. So they were nearly identical. Now, condition, there's some variance across the, 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 the four different in each condition, but aggregately, it looks like it worked out okay. Oh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> you know what the answer that was going to be. So that. <laughs> That's actually, I, I, yeah, that really surprises me, actually. That's really interesting. Um, so, uh, no, I'm not worried about that because the way that we isolated the core of the network was we um, iteratively removed all nodes that had a maximum degree of um, one or zero. So these are nodes that are only connected peripherally, not also like radially across the, the edge of the network. Um, and so we just keep doing that until there are no nodes left that have a degree of one. Um, that means that we're only getting the core and we're not missing the kinds of connections that you're concerned about. Okay, okay, yeah. And so you weren't using like an overall core detection like kind of no. algorithm, okay. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. Apologies to the people whose questions we didn't get to. Let's thank our speakers.